Welcome everybody to the second part of my uh, screencast series about ASP.NET Identity uh, and ZOA. Um, in the first part, um, if you didn't watch it, just try it out. We just built up our database and created some data access layer using Entity Framework and did some fancy stuff with database project there. Um, today, I want to go into um, a little bit in the part REST facade. So we will prepare everything for data access, um, not, not data access, uh, sorry, for the logic layer. We will implement some repositories. We will see uh, a little bit of the tooling, which I mentioned in the first part. Um, especially we will use AutoMapper and AutoFAC uh, for dependency injection. So um, this part is um, mainly for wiring everything up in the in the logic layer and it will be interesting for those of you which are um, trying to work to make uh, clean solutions it's just my implementation but i hope uh, you will get some inspiration for your own projects so just one word um, it's still not the um, core theme here, the core issue ASP.NET uh, ASP identity is not targeted here, especially because uh, we are still not there. So if you are more sophisticated and you won't uh, see anything from this stuff, just jump ahead and wait for the next serious part. Okay, so let's go and um, go to Visual Studio. So today, because there's a lot of coding, I will show everything step by step, but at some parts I will just copy and paste um, pre-prepared uh, source code. So, okay, um, just take a look at my notes. Uh, we will start by adding a new project. So for doing this, I just add a new solution folder called Logic. And in this solution folder, I will add a new project which I will name logic.shared of type class library. It's a straightforward class library and I just create a new folder here in my file system, call it logic and in this folder I will create this project and then I just get rid of this class and just paste in some stuff which I need all the time. If you've seen the first part, you know that I'm a little bit, no, um, a kind of monk in this uh, stuff. I like clean stuff and that's why I just create this um, default namespace. So now we are ready to go. The first thing I need, I will need is um, a folder enumerations. Then I will need a folder uh, for transport models. I just explain it in a little bit. Um, transport models. If you see me typing um, idiot stuff, it's just because my MIG um, is in front of me and it's just uh, not so easy to see the keyboard. <laughs> Uh, and interfaces. So from this folder names on you can imagine what the purpose of logic.shared will be. Logic.shared will uh, contain all the stuff which is available for all, all, uh, for all other um, projects in the solution, which means the only thing I have to keep in mind is that logic.shared will, will never have a reference to any of the other um, projects in this assembly. That's the main part. So um, the first thing I will introduce um, are interfaces. So what we're going to do in uh, just a few minutes, we will generate so-called repositories. So a repository is nothing more than um, a connector between the data access layer and my logic, which means it's just responsible for getting the data out of the data access layer and transforming it in the right way. So what I will do, 
I have data.core and I have entities here, which are generated by entity framework. Um, I could um, just read out, for, for instance, a user later on for ASP.NET identity and just pass this user class down through all the layers. That's not a good idea because, first of all, um, user is a class which is in the context of entity framework, which means um, it has some logic inside of it, which um, is not necessarily uh, valuable for all other projects down the line. Second of all, if I will use the user, the compiler will complain that I will have to add a uh, reference to entity framework to all those assemblies using a user or accessing a user. I don't want that. I want the user to be simple. So <clears throat> to um, start off with, instead of just going into the interfaces, I will generate a transport model for a an user. So I just add a class and I call it user transport model. Okay, a user transport model is public and because I know that all my models have something in common, because the, uh, most of them ha has got an uh, ID, I just create a new abstract class too, and I call it base transport model. Okay, so I just do. So this base transport model will be the abstract base class for all transport models. Okay, and then it has got one property of type long with the name ID. This just um, is the same thing I did in data.core. So what I'm saying here, each class inheriting from base transport model is a class that uh, will have an ID of type long. That's all. So now back to user transport model and I just go to uh, and say base transport model. Now it inherits and now I will have to add all the stuff which is um, coming from the database. So I just prepared this, just a second. I will copy out this stuff. So there it is. So what you see here is that those are all the properties which um, are in the data.core, identity model, blah, blah, user class two, those properties. I just implemented them. And I just refactored it a little bit because entity framework is using nullable off instead of daytime offset, uh, you know, question mark. So <laughs> I don't have to implement ID because it's coming in from base transport model, so this class uh, is the same as um, the user class from the structure in the database. So, okay, cool. So now <clears throat> that I'm ready to go, let's just jump in and create a new uh, logic layer and call it uh, Add new project, not new item. Um, class library and call it logic.core inside the logic folder too. So just create it and just get um, the correct um, default namespace. Here you go and assembly name without this coding freak stuff. Okay, uh, what I will do next is I will just implement in logic.core a new folder, which is called extensions, because I like to bring convenience to my source code and I will just implement something which is called user extensions just a simple class. So the purpose of this class will be it has to provide extension method methods to the type user. 
So just let me go inside of it and show you what I mean. I just prepared it and I just copy in the stuff and now I have to reference logic.shared. He's recognizing it. I have to use data.core2 and just let me uncomment this line. I'll just get rid of this line. And that's what the purpose of this class is. So what this class will do is something like this. Return new user transport model from source, which is the user from the database. And I just say ID of the transport models equals source ID. And now I would have to do all this stuff again and again and again. And I don't like uh, such kind of stuff. So to get rid of those um, left and right hand side code, I will uh, introduce the first NuGet package, which will be AutoMapper. So AutoMapper, let me bring it in via NuGet. AutoMapper. It's just um, a very, very, you know, um, famous package, as you can see. AutoMapper is <clears throat> a tool which is able to inspect two sites of, uh, uh, let's say, classes and to, as it says by its name, AutoMap uh, auto the properties from the left to the right side in a very convenient way. So as you've seen just before, we could do something like this using AutoMapper, which is just saying, hey, just get a variable and the variables, um, a variables type will be user transport model because we told AutoMapper, it has a mapper class, to map with the target type hmm, user transport model and using this, this variable of type user to get this uh, instance. So in order to tell AutoMapper that it will be able to just generate those uh, mappings, we have to just uh, configure AutoMapper. Now let's go just for a first test to our test console, which we just introduced last time. And let's just configure AutoMapper. Let's get rid of this stupid test. We don't need it anymore. And let's configure AutoMapper here. To do this, we have to implement Auto or get the NuGet package for AutoMapper here too. Let's bring it into place. There it is. And now we could do something like this. And we could say, hey, Listen, we want you to, um, a dear AutoMapper, we want to give you a configuration. This is one possibility to, to make this stuff happen. And please, if you uh, just see a user, um, you should be able to generate it. Just I just show you the T's. So if you see a user, you are uh, able to generate a user transport model out of it and vice versa. Tr um, it's the same thing. So let's just it, test it out. We just generate a new user. Oh man. New user. And let's say we just give him the ID of 10, the username of test and some email. Sorry for this. So now we have a user. And now we just take our logic from the extension method. And we just say, hey, just please AutoMapper map um, the user to another thing. And we will just hit a breakpoint here and see what happens. OK, let's go on. So now. This was our user and our user has some stuff. And the result here is uh, a user transport model, which has all the properties mapped, um, which uh, AutoMapper saw. 
So that's cool. Um, that's how our user extension is working. So let's test it out. Let's uh, just say, hey, result is not this. Result is user dot to. So we need a reference to logic core to make this happen. So now I hope reshaper comes into place and shows us, hey, there's a two transport model and this should work the same way too. Oh, not a colon, sorry. Okay, now the same thing happens. Automapper is in place. The only thing which is very unnerving is I have to do this stuff for all the types and stuff like that all in all my programs. And to just um, simplify things, I like simplification, we will go into Logic Core, add a new folder and call this folder, let's say Utils. And let's just bring out, bring in some new class and call it Startup Util. And I just prepared this too. Um, so uh, just don't like to show you too much. Um, let's just bring it to this place. So let's see. Is this cool? Just the command to just refactor. Okay, so this static class. Um, has just one simple method, which is called uh, init logic, and it has a parameter which uh, um, which I will explain later, and it's just doing all the initializing stuff. And now I can go to my program and I just say, hey, you know what? Go to the startup util and call init logic with just you know not the true but the default which is false. So this should work again. works and just to show you that this is necessary let me bring this um, out of scope again and now we should get an exception because automapper is saying hey i don't know what what you want me to do because there's no mapping configured from um, user to user transport model i don't know how to do this so uh, what i wanted to show you is that this line of code just uh, virus up auto mapper at the morning uh, at the moment so okay let's get rid of this again so this is something we have to this is the only line we have to keep in mind when we just <coughs> bring in our um, you know projects that are working against our logic okay back to the user extensions now you've you see what i want to do i want to have simple two transport model method extension method so that uh, in any um, position of my code where i need to transform a user to its transport model i just hit dot to transport model and that's it so that's my target so um, this is the extension which we brought uh, brought in and now we can go back to our logic shared so just to um, see what we will do now. We have a transport model which inherits from base transport model and is for users and now we will bring in our interfaces. So the first interface will be the I uh, user repository. So what I will say here um, and I have prepared this too is I want to define all the um, needed logic for one user repository that must be implemented by a user repository. So I just, um, as you can see here, I'm saying that a user repository, a valid one, has to provide for the moment those methods. So it has to be able to give me a user by a database ID, to give me a user by a mail address, to give me a an user, uh, if I have a username, to give me all users uh, and to check if a password is correct or password hash is correct. 
and um, to check if a user exists and stuff like that. So I decided to um, just make a little um, a thing happened. It is the is pass correct uh, method <coughs> uh, will not just return true or false, but a password check result, which is nothing more than an enum. So that's why I prepared um, just a second, let me copy this out. I prepared this enumerations. So let's add a class. And now I just copy in this enumeration, which I prepared too. So this is the password check result. I just implemented, it's a good advice to implement unknown too, if something goes wrong. But if um, the check result, is one that means success and so on. I have user not found, password incorrect, user not confirmed and user is locked, all this stuff. Uh, so now this repository interface is ready and is valid. So now that I have this repository interface, I have to implement this repository. Um, and for doing this, I just go to Logic Core and I just add a new folder call it repositories and add a new class which is not user repository but base repository which is an abstract class so i um prepared this too just a second so base repository will bring in some fancy stuff. Let's implement everything and now just take a look what happens here. So first of all, I say that base repository and um, meaning all repositories is um, I disposable. Um, if I say I disposable, I have to implement one method which is called dispose. And here I have uh, implemented this interface by using a uh, virtual method dispose giving her the value of true and then calling GC to press finalize this. And this is the default pattern plus um, to implement it in the destructor and call it dispose false. As you can see, this is the purpose of this dispose method because this flag indicates if this dispose which is uh, coming in here is triggered via the dispose, dispose method or for example via the destructor. If it's triggered via the destructor um, we will do nothing, we will just return because um, that's an uncommon uh, situation which means we are in kind of exception situation and we don't want to um, spend any time on doing something. We just want to leave him alone. But if the dispose is called clear or in the default way coming from this place, we just say, hey, this is not, um, this is disposing is uh, tr um, true, which means he, will, he won't come here, but he may exit it uh, when this method was called more than one time on the second run because we just say, hey, this post is, is uh, done. So um, now he's complaining here about DB context value, blah, blah, blah. He's complaining at this position because, as you can see here, we don't have any reference from logic.core to entity framework. But logic.core uses entity framework clearly because it's going uh, to our, just on the top, to our context util, which generates an identity context. Uh, so we have to set a NuGet package reference to entity framework. Yes, because um, this core logic needs it. So now you can see it is in place and um, now he's not complaining anymore. This is our base repository. Now let's bring in our user repository. Repository. 
Okay, so I just prepared this too, clearly enough. And let me bring in um, the implementation because we will see what we need to make this uh, work. It's not ready. So the first of all, it's uh, inheriting from base repository and it's implementing iUser repository, repository and thus it gets an iUser repository. As you can see here, um, we have to do some work to bring uh, to, to get this uh, done. We have to implement role repository too. But for the moment, <coughs> you can see here, hey, we have an add user async method which we have to do something here too and we have for instance this get user by id let's take a look at it what, because all methods do the same stuff it's very straightforward it's going to the db context db context is coming from base repository and it is um, you know going to a lazy and getting the value of the lazy so now it's a place to just uh, explain what a lazy is. A lazy here uh, is saying, hey, I give you a variable which um, has a property of type um, of name val value, which will, will be of type whatever you want, in this case identity entities. Just please in the constructor tell me how I can get this value if it is needed. And now I'm sitting here and doing nothing. Till the moment someone, some um, position in code hits the value the first time. If this happens, the lazy um, is inspecting itself and saying, hey, this is the first time somebody wants the value. And when this happened, happens, this um, uh, code is executed and the result is stored somewhere uh, in a variable. So the second time, the third time and so on, somebody wants the value of a lazy, uh, this line of code is not, uh, does not get executed. Instead of it's using all the time the same value. So this is a lazy pattern. We get something, but we only get it if we need it. So in terms of the repository now, we have this DB context, which is in the first place a new one or the same all the time. And we just go to the users table and we use the find async method of uh, entity framework or link to entities, which is the most um, uh, fast, the, the fastest way to get a single uh, entity. Um, we can use find async only if we have a primary key, which is the case here, because I, as you maybe know from the first part, all my entities have a primary key of type long. So this is very fast. This is um, better, if possible, than doing single or default on this entity. So the last part here, what you see is a dot configure await false, which is nothing more than um, we tell the uh, TPL, the task parallel library, to um, not to try to get the synchronization context, the current one, and thus trying to re-enter this synchronization context after this await um, is done. We don't want this because uh, we don't need it. Uh, this is our you know, um, uh, leave uh, util method and this method uh, should be able to uh, be used inside of an await or um, if somebody wants to do dot result on this method it will work um, very very uh, good too. Um, if you leave out configure await uh, and use dot result for instance inside a console application it may lead to a lock. Um, it's not part of this uh, tutorial to show you why uh, but this uh, is considered a good a good technique uh, to use configure await false in library methods. Microsoft does it too. So that's it and when this returns in a non-null value, we just use our two transport model method. As you can see, now because of this extension method and all the base class stuff, this code is very, very straightforward and easy to read. 
it's just doing something on the context and it's one line, two line. Um, uh, here is something more, but it's just checking something and uh, that's it. Um, I implemented the add user as a method too. And now this uh, method um, needs an extension method, but this extension method is vice versa. The add user async gets a user transport model, not the entity version. And now we see, we say, hey, the new user will be whatever the model is, transform it to an entity. So to get this done, we have to implement another extension method and thus another class. And I just call it user transport model extensions. So I prepared this too as you might suggest oh, uh, not suggest you know what i mean as you might expect it so this is my extension um, method for user transport model which means when somebody has a user transport model it has now a two entity method extension method which does the auto mapper mapping the vice versa way so now this method is happy and is saying hey i know what you mean and the last thing we have to implement is a role repository. So let's go on. It's the same thing as with the user. Step one, let's implement a new interface and call it I role repository. Of course, I have it. Just a second. Here it is. And for the moment, this method only has one um, uh, or this interface only has one method get role by name async okay so now let's implement this re repository it's a role repository here it is role repository and role repository is this so role repository is just one uh, method it's inheriting from base repository and that's why we get a db context property here now and it's going to the roles table and getting the role for this name so and re uh, returning the id or null if there's no id so because this is now implemented our user repository isn't complaining anymore but you see here something very important what we see here is that we say this user repository has no default constructor anymore because the only constructor it provides um, says hey i need a role repository because this is very very important for me i need it for instance for adding a user so um how does this ro role repository come into place? So for, for example, we could do something like this. We can go to our logic and say something like, hey, uh, var user repo equals new user repository, which needs a new role repository. So that, that is valid, but this line um, introduce, introduces some problems because one could say, hey, if you do this all the time, so what is the interface good for? What is the iUser repository interface and the iRole repository interface good for? Because it has no sense to generate this interface in the first place. Yeah, that's true because we are not using a technique which is called dependency injection. Dependency injection um, is used, is a, it is something uh, which is coming out from another per, uh, pattern which is called inversion of control. So what this says is there has to be some sort of um, dispatcher or, or God logic or call it like you want, which knows that if somebody wants an iRole repository, um, what iRole repository to bring into place. So. The point behind all this stuff is that we might 
bring in at some point, and it will be in this cast, a second role repository or a second user repository, which are inheriting the same interface, but are behaving differently. Why and uh, how we are showing this later on, but for this moment, we have to bring in some logic, this God logic, which knows all this stuff. And you could write it by your own. It's not that complicated to write an IOC container, but there are a few good IOC containers outside. And one of them is called Autofag. <laughs> so a lot of auto stuff here. So let's bring it, bring an Autofag. Let's search it. And as you can see, it's um, very popular too. Let's bring Autofag into Logic Core first of all. So we install it and the now artifact is here and now go to our startup util and just I just paste in this code and then we talk about it. What is going on here? First of all, artifact brings in something which is an so-called container, an artifact i container. It's an implementation detail of Autofag. Just to show how, uh, show you how to use it. And now go here and just implement this. Let's just get rid for a moment of this and concentrate on this. So Autofag brings a lot of um, nice features and is very convenient to use. First of all, there is something called a container builder. So to build up this container, we need a container builder. This container is public static, which means during the runtime of our program, there will be only one container property because it's a static startup util and it has, it has got this container. Okay, cool. And this container is this God logic thing, which I told you. And we just could use code like this and tell the builder, hey builder, please register type, uh -huh, and just interpret this type as an interface. Mm -hmm. So what he knows, if somebody wants an I user repository, I give him the test user repository, which is not ready yet, because that's why I just uncommented this line. So the, another way to do it, because this is very, you know, dangerous in terms of you can forget things. Let's bring in, first of all, the dangerous way. To show you why we don't want to use it. So let's say we, we will say user repository and I user repository. So and now bring in role repository and I role repository. Just to sum it up, we're just saying hey autofic, if somebody wants a I user repository, just be aware that you give him a user repository. And if he wants an IRO repository, never mind who wants it, just give him this one. So now just take a look at the user repository. So here is a magic line of code. Um, in the moment this constructor is called, it says, hey, give me an IRO repository. I don't know from where, I don't know who, just somebody please give me an IRO repository. This Positioning code is um, seen by Autofag and this rule will come into place and in saying, hey, he needs this, I give him an instance of this. That's what um, IOC containers do. So test it out. How can we test it out? You see here the last line, the container is where the magic happens. So let's go and check our line. So I have prepared something in our program class. Let's go here and say we need this. So first of all, he needs the iUser repository and then he, he doesn't know what dot resolve means. So that's why we bring in autofag here too. In our console application. So now let's say this one and let's inspect what instance will be now. Let's go here 
And let's take a look. Instance is not now, which is good. An instance is just of type, you know, um, user repository. We don't know how it's being created. We don't know who created it, but it's just working. The good thing about it, let's go to deeper code instance dot uh, add user async new user transport model. We don't need all this stuff and the role name is admin. So now go to this line and now debug it a little bit. So I step into this method and it's com uh, coming into place and now let's see what role repository is and it's a role repository because this line was executed by autofag was uh, um, you know hooked up by autofag just hit a breakpoint here and now you see we just hit the breakpoint let's go to the call stack and as you can see this constructor is called by some external code which is nothing more than autofag which uh, is uh, just generating this constructor because we said, hey, container, give me a user repository. And now he did something new, mm -hmm, user repository, and he's detecting, hey, he needs a IRO repository. I know how to get it. So that's the magic of IOC containers. So let's go to our program and get rid of this code just for testing purposes. And... Uh, Go to the startup util and let's talk about these two lines. So what happens, these two lines are fine, but what happens when um, at some point we get another i <laughs> repository and another <laughs> repository and we forget to register those repositories. That's very inconvenient. We have to keep in mind that every time we add a new i something repository, we have to do something here in this uh, in this code and to get rid of it we could do something like this which is um, following first of all we are getting the current executing assembly and what we're doing is we're using the builder register assemblies uh, assembly types give uh, pass in the assembly which we just uh, retrieved and then we filter uh, and saying hey all the type names that um, not contain the word test, but they are, which are ending with the part repository, should be implemented as interfaces or uh, should be um, um, configured depending on the interface they implement. That's what we say. So that means if we go to the user repository, uh, repository he's saying, hey, there's no test in the word user repository, but it ends with repository. So it's interesting for me. And now this last part as implemented interfaces says, hey, it's implementing the interface I user repository. And that's why I just auto generate this line as I user report, uh, repository. And uh, in that way, we cannot forget to register um, all the types in autofac which is good. It has a little, little, little pitfall. It is slightly slower than um, just writing down the code because it uses a sam um, reflection. But this happens only one time during the complete uh, lifetime of, of our code. So I, I like it. As, you, as you've seen earlier, I just uncommented two lines and that's the complete reason for using uh, dependency injection, I will show you how. So let's say we will unit test our complete logic. And for that reason, we just implement a new folder in logic.core and we call it test repositories. So I just, um, let me bring in the first one that will be a new one called test user repository. So I just prepared this too, of course. It's a little bit different. Um, yeah, it's a little bit different. 
and uh, we have to just bring in all our interfaces and what I did here is I implemented an I use a repository in a way that it is not working against the database but instead against a text file which we just talk um, in a second uh, about so let me just just correct some stuff so what I will do here it has the same structure as the other I use a repository meaning it has a um, the same constructor telling Autofac, hey, I need, I need you, I need uh, the correct role repository. But instead of using a DB context, an entity context, it's just using a text file, which um, it expects to be in uh, subfolders uh, stores, and it has to be named user store txt. So you will see later when we go into a unit test where this file comes from. So this is a simple CSV file and it's just using splitting and stuff like that and that's it. Okay, um, now in in, in, uh, as a difference between this user store and our default user store, this one is using is making heavy use uh, from task from result because we don't have any as a method here. Um, because the store is loaded and that's it. We don't have to do any async and await here. So we're using task from result and um, the other stuff is uh, completely the same as in the user store. So uh, when we have this one in place, we can go and implement the second one, uh, add class and that's a test role repository let's go there and bring it in and let's say yeah it's uh, it's the same thing but it's um, searching for a role store txt and um, it has just this one method get role uh, id by name as so now we have these two stores in place. We can go here in the startup util and we can say, hey, um, use them. And now we say when somebody passes true here, we just go into this uh, part of the if and not into this one, which means he's just uh, searching for those um, repositories. And what we can do instead of it, we can do a little bit um, convenience stuff and saying if tname contains test. Now we want those test repositories. That's just a convention we did and that's the only thing we have to keep in mind that uh, each repository which we use now uh, has to start with the name test and end with the name repository. Um, or I said it has contained the name test. So let's test it out. We go to our console and we are saying, can we just undo? Oh, it's okay. Uh, let me bring it in. And now let's uh, say we need a an user repository, instance one, and we need instance two, um, something when we go here and say init logic with true. Okay, let's set a breakpoint and let's inspect them. Instance one is user repository. Instance 12, I just did a mistake, is a test user repository because we just set an init logic with the parameter true. We said, hey, please, automapper go in this and not in this um, branch of the if. So that's what we wanted to do and now just to um, wrap it up, now Autofac is re responsible for generating instances by uh, searching for interfaces and Automapper um, is responsible for map between types. So Automapper is one of the things we have to keep in mind that we have to create mappings. Um, he, he cannot assume those mappings. I don't know exactly if Automapper has something equal to this one from Autofac. 
um, but I, I, I have to do this all the time. Otherwise, I can I get expectations. Maybe you could do something more sophisticated here. So cool. Now we have this in place. We could go and create our unit tests out first. That's a, a main thing here. So let's go and create a new test project. Um, so new project from test and we go and uh, create a unit test project and I go into the test folder and I say it's a tests because the folder is named like this and it's testing logic core. This is the only place where I use three parts um, in project names because it's a convention in our team. You can do it the way it's more convenient to you, of course. So test logic core and it's still an assembly, which means um, we need this stuff. So um, let's go there and add the first test. Let me check what I named it user extension test so let's do this add unit or class user extension tests because in most cases it contains more than one test and now let me bring in my source code and this is the source code now so user extensions is um, in logic.core. Um, startup util is in this assembly, in it logic true. And now here, as you can see, we need this instance, which means we need autofac. Let's bring it in. Autofac. Now this guy is happy. Now we need the interfaces from Logic Shared. And now we have a unit test. So first part. So this one will go and uh, just initialize this uh, or use the startup util. Now you can see why we have something like a startup util because it will, would be very, very inconvenient. And go to peak definition. Where is it? Mm, peak definition. You know, if we have to just copy and paste this code all the time, this would be a mess. And that's why uh, wrapping it up in a method seems to be a good idea. So init logic true. And this attribute and this signature is telling the test mm, machinery of um, uh, Visual Studio that it has to execute this method before any test out of this um, this uh, test class is executed. So um, no matter what, how many test methods I will have in this class, it will first of all do this stuff and then run the first test method in this class. So cool. Um, now uh, I could say, hey, give me an instance of iUser repository um, and it will be a test user repository. This means we need this uh, store file. So to get the store file, we just uh, create a folder named stores in our test project. We just add a new file, which is named, first of all, role store txt, a new item. And let's go to general and text file. So role store txt. And now just this is a role store id name id name uh, next one is the user store mm, new item text file is still selected user store uh, to be sure txt and now go there and paste in this the, the logic is id uh, role id login uh, no username mail address, password hash, uh, 
Im, uh, is email confirmed and is user logged out currently. Okay, so now we have this in place. We just go here and say, hey, please copy always this stuff or co copy is if newer. It's not so you know, expensive, copy if newer, which means he will copy this to the output folder um, inside this folder st structure. So when we just rebuild this, and go to the file explorer and go to bin debug you see he generated the stores folder and put in all this two files so now that this is done we should be able to execute this test so let's try it out and let's debug it a little bit so I just go into my test explorer. As you can see, he found now the two transport model test. And I debug this method. And now let's see what happens. Okay. He's going into um, the test role repository. Um, and he um, he's going into this place because the a constructor of the user repository creates this repository now okay that's not so nice here it is now he has a role repository and he's just setting it now we just say user id is one and now we just call our instance to get user id now we uh, come into this method and this method says hey i need to go to the store which is lazy again and because the store is hit the first time he goes in reads all lines from uh, this file which are free lines and now i just wrote simple logic which could be written very very more sophisticated and i get the parts and i just add a result for each part i get and so on and so on so let's shift f11 out there and now he's saying, hey, to transport model, uh, search this the one with the ID one and then go to transport model. Come on. And here's to transport model and he's mapping it. And this will be the result. And uh, he's returning it. And now this assert is uh, not null is true. And ID and ID is the same. So that's what we wanted to achieve here. What this means is um, we just implemented uh, a, a simple, simple, simple unit test, which tests the uh, um, functionality of the U, uh, extension method to transport model. But this unit test, I, I choose him because he's doing all the stuff. He has to get the user from a, a store which is not the database, but this is good in this case because it's very, very hard to test against the SQL database um, because you have to ensure that the initial state of the database is always the same if you want to test data-driven. And uh, this is a very easy and stupid, I admit, stupid way to uh, generate test data, but it's, you know, it's working and you can do sophist more sophisticated stuff uh, easily here and at this posi position even going to some you know web service and getting i don't know a list of users or i don't know how you will make it okay so now that this is done uh, we have to check our uh, logic in terms of uh, is it working against the database a simple way to check this is to go in our console Go on the program and just implement this code, uh, this code saying, hey, we just want to initialize without true, which means we want to initialize the real stuff, not the test stuff. Then we uh, get an instance of user repository and we're just saying, hey, check if there's a user with the username um, or uh, yeah, with the username uh, test user and uh, just tell us if this exists. So we go here and just hit it. And now he's saying, no, it, it's not existing. And to check what happened, we could go here 
and check that he was going against the database. Select blah, blah, blah. He is an entity SQL statement. And that means he just uh, has chosen the right one. So with this in place, let's try to create a user. Um, so uh, let's say instance dot add user async var result equals to now he needs a new user transport model let's say new user transport model and he has to be in the user role so now at this position we give him what is needed all the values this model needs so we need an username and we say is it will be test user we need an email which will be test at testde um, we will uh, need a pass hash and it will be something and maybe that's enough so let's say console right line um, result is result so here we need dot result so let's test this one i don't know if this is working i didn't test it let's try it out and now result is one and to check this we do two things i just uncommend it and now just use uh, console right line instance dot uh, user exists as in test user dot result let's see if it exists now and he says true so now maybe let's go to sql management studio and just uh, check the data and talk a little bit about this stuff where's our database our database is test database tables user just ensure first that the user is there oh, come on sql azure i just have a drink of coffee just a second Thank you for your patience. So here you can see he just added the, the user and um, he, if we take a look here, we could say that, where is it? Email confirmed is one. We just take a look at the source code in a second. And uh, logout enabled is zero, which means this user is somehow valid. And now let's take a look at user role, which is very important because we just have a new entry, which is the ID of the user, the ID of the role. And this role, as you might remember, is, or this ID is the ID of the role user. So all this is done by this one. Where is it? Let's go there. By uh, this, li uh, this one line of code, add user async. Let's go there and test it. Let's go test user two, test two, and kind of a little different password. And now let's check what this does, this repository. So let's go there, F11. So first of all, we need the ID for the role user. So he goes into the role repository, the real one. And he says, hey, go to the DB context and get the role with the name user. And please let me know what the ID is. And the ID is one. So now we get, we have this and we don't have to handle exception and return now because we got something. Now we are creating a new entity user. Uh, we are using the model to entity. Let me skip this. And now we get a new user, which has some properties pre-filled. So that was AutoMapper doing the job here. Now that what I've, what I've done is I just uh, pre-generated or pre-filled some uh, properties, as you can see here. This is not very you know secure. 
we don't have email confirmation in our model but this is kind of um, to be serious kind of um, a normal pattern uh, especially when you are uh, using ASP.NET identity to work against internal databases and companies or stuff like that. You don't have email confirmation uh, in those kind of web websites. Uh, you just say, hey, uh, somebody should be able to register a user on behalf of the user uh, instead of the user self-registering him, him, um, himself. So what you can see here is kind of this pattern. So that means an admin could create a user. So what we do next is uh, we just add a new user role, not a new role, but a new user role to this new user. And what is important, it's not sufficient. Uh, so what you can see here, we're just creating a new entity of type user role, which is an own table in our model, this table, user role. We're just creating a new entry for this. And now we are adding this new user role to the user roles. So, and um, when we, uh, we do this, not by adding it to the user roles of the context, but to the user roles of the new user, which is very important because in this way, we can just add the user to the context and the user will add its roles to the context too. So that we now here are performing one single operation, uh, adding two items, a new user. And before doing this, he will, entity framework, I mean entity framework, he will generate a new user role. So he's doing two things here. And now we are uh, the, the problem is that our new user at this position, we you know, it has an ID, to be honest. So save changes was ready. We don't need to reload async. I don't know if this is true all the time because this is a pattern I use all the time. Cool, uh, Entity Framework has detected it. So we can skip this one. This is not very uh, important now. And we could just return the ID. So let's do it. And now the ID is two. And as we have seen, we can just omit this one, reload async, it's just this one. And now, oh, you know what? To be sure, if new user dot ID equals zero, please reload async. I think this is the most secure way. Okay, you know, I'm suspicious. Um, now, Let's take a look if this happened. And as you can see, we have two users now. Everything is fine. So um, if you just take a look at it um, on just to close up all the stuff, if you take a look at our source code right now, it was a lot of stuff, I admit, uh, especially for beginners. There was a lot of new stuff and people who are thinking about, hey, how could, can I make clean solutions? And um, that's just, um, you know, because I recognize that a lot of tutorials on the Internet, they are, they are just saying, hey, I have a repository here. So and I just implemented IOC and then they step further and you're just sitting there and saying, so what the where is this repository coming from and who is doing all this magic behind? And I wanted to show you one way how to do it. There are several tools and possibilities to do it even better than I've shown you today. Um, but I think it, it just makes the idea clear. Um, and I hope it was interesting. I have to split up now my parts a little bit more. I just plan to do three parts, but I recognize hey, that's too much um, uh, for one part. So I will come up with, in the next part with uh, some more logic for um, the, all the identity stuff. We will go deeper into identity now because we can do it and we will uh, extend our repositories as we need it uh, in, in further part of this tutorial. Anyway, uh, thanks for watching and uh, stay tuned.